Central Church. Hey, if you're watching online or you're joining us live, we want to invite you to sing along. Let's put our hands together. Let's lift our voices.
My brain is flaming I don't know which way to go no. You can't see lift me higher Like a sweet song of a fire And you light my enormous sky Burning love oh, Burning love Yes, I'm a homo, homo, burning love Well, I'm a homo, homo, burning love Yes, I'm a homo, homo, burning love Well, I'm a homo, homo Wise men Only fools rush in But I can tell Falling in love with you Shut If I, I can help falling in love with you. You ain't learned about a hand on your own, cracking all the time. You ain't another not a hound on me, baby, cracking all the time. But I don't know Just like this Bright light city Gonna send my soul Gonna set my soul on fire I got a whole lot of money That's ready to burn So I get those stakes up higher There's a thousand pretty women Oh, in and out there And they're all living The devil in the cat I'm just a devil with love to spare. Sing! Fever, all speakers. Fever, all speakers. Well, people all speak this with you. Neon flashing and your water bandits crashing. All those hopes down the drain. Well, people all speak this tonic. Day and the night, out on the night. In the daytime, you see it once. You'll never be the same again. I wanna keep on running, gonna have me some fun if it calls me in my very last time. If I wasn't a broken in, I'll always remember that I had a swing in time. Well, I wanna give everything that I've got. Lady luck to you, Slip, those eyes stay hot. But let me shoot a step, we'll have a shot. Leave her on sweetest, leave her. Come on, that was epic, wasn't it? Hey, you know why we can have fun in church is because we have a God who's a good God. Would you agree with that? 
We're kicking off a brand new series about relationships. It's called A Crazy Little Thing Called Love. I can't wait for you to hear Pastor Judd's message about that this weekend. You know, Vegas is a fun city. It's one of the most famous cities in the world, and God is showing up in a church called Central in a powerful way. And I can't wait for you to meet a couple of my friends this weekend. Help me welcome Nikki and her husband, Jay, this weekend. You're going to recognize Nikki. I know you will. She's an integral part of our weekend experience every weekend. Thank you guys for coming and sharing your story with the Central family this weekend. You know, I just love it when God's doing something special in people's lives, and Nikki and Jay are, are that couple. You know, they, they had this sense, especially Nikki, you know, many times it's the wives who God speaks to first, that they were going to come to Central. And God was already telling her that, and that weekend they ended up being here, and she thought, man, this is pretty great. And then a couple weeks later, they came to an event called Fall Fest in 2019, and it was game over. They're like, this is our church, and they've never left, and they plugged right in, serving with all their time, with all their heart, with all, all their financial resources just to help this church continue to make an impact here in the valley. And you probably recognize Nikki. She's one of our key hosts. She leads on our worship team. She does uh, worship at, a, at an event called CR. And uh, yeah, and she's, she's an integral part that way. And then Jay serves on our safety and security team. But it's obvious that God has showed up in your life and shown you both that giving yourselves for his kingdom is what it's all about. Tell us when all that made sense, because I know you guys have been blessed with, with much, but then you, you know what it's like to lose, lose it all, and then to kind of place God in a different position in your life. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, we got married in 2008, and we, we're both in real estate, and so everybody know what, knows what happened in 2009, oh, yeah. and we lost everything. Mm. We lost everything, and uh, we both grew up in church, but, um, and we knew about giving, but we weren't faithful in giving. And so it was around 2010 when we were, were praying, and God challenged us both. And he said that you're either going to trust me with your finances or you're not. And so right then was when we decided that we were going to honor God and put him first um, with our finances, and we've been doing that ever since. And you guys truly put God in the center of your life. You know, it's, it's amazing when you put God first, how he can begin to show up and bless you in ways that he couldn't do unless we just gave him that place. And I know you both have experienced tremendous blessing in your life by placing him there. Share with us kind of the blessings that you both have experienced of putting God in the center of, of everything. Jay, <laughs> you're all man. So I'm just thankful to God for just keeping us. You know, we relocated here and we didn't lose everything, but we started all over again, moving to Henderson. We knew like one person when we moved here and God has blessed us not only financially, but he's blessed us with a church home. He's blessed us with family. Our children are prospering in school. And even during COVID, you know, we moved here and five months later, the whole city shut down. <laughs> so God actually kept us and our business actually prospered and, grow and grew during COVID. And uh, we just reminded ourselves through COVID, relocating and starting all over again, that commitment we made to God and God just continues to bless us in every area of our life. It's so good. <laughs> I've experienced that same thing. And you know, you both were here last weekend and you heard Pastor Judd give this challenge. It's called the Generosity Challenge, a 90-day challenge, in fact, where he challenged the central family to trust God. And I know you both have lived out trusting God now for several years in your life, but I know especially having a front row seat in your lives that you'd want to You'd want to challenge the central family in the same way to, to take that step, right? What, what, would you, what would you say to the central family in taking Judd up on that challenge? Nikki. I get excited. Nikki's I do. I get excited, way. Pastor Mike, because um, last week when he was challenging us and when he pointed out those cards in the back, um, our daughter was sitting with us and she's an adult now, um, but she took that card. And for us, that meant so much because she has seen 
how God has moved in our lives. She has seen when we've had nothing. She's seen when, um, when God has blessed us beyond measure and when we're able to give back. And so um, we, we've, always we've taught our children to live life like this. And when we had nothing, we trusted God and he trusted us with more. And so we continue to live like this. And so family, I challenge you, if you haven't signed up, if you haven't committed to the generosity challenge, 90 day challenge, I challenge you to do that because we have seen God move in so many ways, in so many areas of our lives. And the way I grew up in church is you can't beat God given. Mm. You can't beat God given. Yeah. So, so I, I challenge you to accept this challenge and watch God move in your life. Wow, that is a great challenge. Well, I want to say to both of you, thank you for loving Jesus and loving our church and being such great friends and an integral part of impacting so many people's lives. Central family, would you help me thank them for all that they've been? <laughs> oh, I don't know if I could encourage you any more than what Nikki just challenged you all. If you'd like to learn more about that 90-day challenge, there is a prayer card in the seat back in front of you. You can grab that. There's a QR code. You can scan it. It'll take you to a video where Pastor Judd talks about the challenge and ways that you can take that next step. But become a generosity rock star is a great way to start. That's where you just commit to sign up to give a reoccurring gift online. But on behalf of those that you'll be impacting and rescuing and giving hope to, thank you for your generosity. If you'd like to give this weekend, it's easy to do. Go to central.family or centralchurch.online or just find one of our generosity team members in the lobby right after our experience and you can give that way as well. Well, why don't we go to God in prayer? Just ask his blessing upon our lives. Would you join me? Well, Jesus, we pause right now. Literally, we know you're here. We acknowledge it because we sense you in this room. We know you've already been at work and you're gonna continue to do just that. We humbly bring ourselves to you. We open our hearts to you. We ask you to speak to us and to show up and to be our God. God, pour yourself out on our lives today. May we sense your love and your peace, your gentleness and your kindness during this time of worship. Jesus, you promise when we lift your name on high, you will literally put yourself on our lives. You tell us as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. You promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us. You promise that you who began a good work in us would complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. And today we, we just claim that work and we pray that you'd continue to complete your work in each of our lives today. And may we know after we leave here today that we have met with the God of the universe and our lives will be forever marked and changed by you showing up in a powerful, rich way in our lives. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.
today and you're struggling and you're going through a difficult season we at Central are committed to walk through those seasons with you in fact we want to take a moment and just pray for you pray for your circumstances your situations if you're here today and you just need God's help no matter what you're faced with would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air if I can pray for you today even online just slip your hand up in the air and if you're next to somebody with their hand raised I want to encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them let's just pray Let's ask God to do what only he can do. God, right now we lift up our friends to you. For those who are struggling, for those who are walking in this room today or even watching online who are saying, God, we need your help. Your word says that you are near the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. So today, Lord, remind us that you are near. We set our focus on you. We set our attention on you. We thank you for being a good God. We love you and we praise you for it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, amen.
sing this together and just make it your prayer today. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. And I never want to for blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song So take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. So take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Every voice sing this out. Come on. I'm caught up in your presence. I just wanna see.
Pastor Judd's kicking off an amazing new series. Why don't you be seated? Let's give it up for our online hosts. What an amazing time of worship with our Central Live. We want to welcome all of our locations yes. with a special shout out to Morelia, Mexico. Yes. Welcome, guys. Yes, I love that. Also, shout out to you guys who are watching online. Like Ja'Kai, watching from Alabama. Honey, Christina is on vacation in Mexico. Yeah. Okay, I love this. <laughs> and the Miller family who gathered seven people for a watch party in Seattle, Washington. Hey guys. I love that. Thank you guys so much for joining us and for worshiping with us. Yeah, absolutely. And to the women and the men watching in prison facilities through our partnership with God Behind Bars yes. and the Pando app, we are so glad that you're here. Yes. Now, no matter where you are experiencing church from, let's put our hands together and get ready for this message of hope. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you guys this morning. I hope you're doing well. Glad you're here. We're te kicking off this new teaching series, crazy little thing called love. And you know, love is kind of crazy, right? I mean, it, you just kind of lose your mind, you know, when you're, when you're in love. I, I, I know when I first started dating Lori, you just start doing things you, you normally wouldn't do. I thought we were just out like hanging out and we'd go into stores and she'd be like, oh, look, this shirt. And she would pull it out and she'd be like, you know, this shirt would look great on you. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't even like that shirt. She's like, try, try this shirt on. I'm like, I don't, I don't like it. I don't want it. She says, please. You know, I'm like, okay. You know, and so I go in and I put the shirt on, right? Then I walk out. She's like, it's your color. I didn't even know I had a color, man. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, I'm at the cash register buying the shirt, right? Like, and I've been doing that kind of stuff now for 26 years. <laughs> Love just makes you kind of lose your mind, and it's a mystery. Even the Bible recognizes this. The book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, the great wisdom book, Here's what it says, chapter 30, beginning in verse 18. When we get to the red word, say it out loud here with me. It says, there are three things that amaze me. No, four things that I don't understand. Now, this is the wisdom book of the Bible. Here's some things I don't understand. How an eagle glides through the sky. Okay, that's cool. How a snake slithers on a rock. How a ship navigates the ocean. And how a man, what? loves a woman. Even the Bible is saying, just give it up, man. <laughs> You're not gonna fully understand. It's a mystery, right? And yet there are some things that we can do that can help us maybe as we relate to one another, as we relate to our kids, as we relate to friends. And the truth is like relationships are such a huge part of our lives. Now, statistics say that 94% of people will marry at least once in their lifetime and that 75% of people who are divorced will remarry within two years. Somebody's like, I'm getting remarried? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Some of you are like, no, I am not getting remarried. The truth is it affects all kinds of aspects of our lives, but we receive so little encouragement in how to grow and improve relationships, whether it's parenting, friendships. I got no training in relationships in school. I learned more about parallel parking than how to navigate family or romantic relationships in my life when I was in school. And yet all the health and well-being studies show that the quality of your life is really set and determined by the quality of your relationships. In other words, life is hard for all of us. Crazy things happen. But if stuff's good at home, if stuff's good with your kids, if stuff's good in your family, then you can handle all that other stuff, right, that comes at you. But when things are not good at home and they're not good with your family, they're not good with your friends, your associates, then, man, there's drama, right? Drama for everybody. And so relationships are a huge part of our life and they can be very, very challenging. And what we're gonna do over the next five weeks is dig in, try to draw out some principles from a very uh, unknown and obscure book of the Bible that can help us as we navigate it. Um, we're gonna look at the Song of Solomon over the next five weeks together. And so the first encouragement I have for you when it comes to improving relationships in our life is to just look to the world's greatest love song, the world's greatest love song. And I know some of you thought that was like Whitney Houston right, or the Beatles, or whatever, right? But I want to suggest to you that it is the Song of Solomon. It says in the very first verse that it is 
the greatest song. So it's the song of all songs. All right. Now, in our world, when it comes to love songs, like there's all kinds of genres of music that, that do love songs, but country music sort of captures to me the funniest love song lyrics. I mean, my goodness, right? You can't really compete with stuff like this. This is actually a lyric from a country music song. Get your tongue out of my mouth. <laughs> because I'm kissing you goodbye. I mean... Only country music, even hip hop can't really pull that off at that level, right? That's just country music all the way, man. Like, like here's another one from the 50s. This is actually a title of a song. How could you believe me when I said I loved you when you know I've been a liar all my life? <laughs> all right. It's like it's your fault you believe me. You knew I was a liar. All right, one more lyric from a country song. She ran off with my best friend and I miss him. <laughs> Country music for the win! Yeah. Well, 3,000 years ago, Solomon wrote a song, and um, it's recorded in the Bible. Now, Solomon was king over Israel from 971 to 931 BC. He reigned in Israel for 40 years in peace. He took the throne when he was 20 years old. And, um, you know, he wrote over, according to the Bible, 3,000 Proverbs, uh, over 1,005 Psalms, like these hymns, songs to God, and at least one extended love poem that we have in the Bible, the Song of Solomon. Now, we have some of his Proverbs mentioned, but this is the only, like, song that we have from Solomon. And some people are like, well, I'm not, you know, some people question whether Solomon, the king, actually wrote the Song of Solomon. But verse 1 says, this is Solomon's song. So you can go figure that out. I don't know, man. Have fun with that. And um, you're going to find it kind of tucked away in the Old Testament. It's about in the middle of your Bible. And the Song of Solomon is really a Cinderella story. How, how many of you remember Cinderella? Whole thing, right? My daughter was little. She, like, wanted to eat on Cinderella plates, and she'd sleep on Cinderella sheets, and she would dress up like, you know, a princess. And so we took a photo of her one day uh, when she came out with kind of all of her gear on. Look at this. She got... She's working it, man, because she's got like the princess dress, but it's the Thomas, the Thomas the Train hat and vest, and then the Spider-Man gloves, just to put a little splash in there, you know, a little, a little fashion design going on. But, but she would wait for me at the base of the stairs when, <clears throat> when it was time to go to bed, and, and she would say, Dad, carry me up the stairs like a princess. And so I carry her up the stairs and, and put her in bed. She was all about it. You know, there's 1,500 different versions of the Cinderella story all over the world. And basically, it's a story of a prince who falls in love with like a peasant girl. They develop a relationship. Love allows them to conquer all of their differences and challenges. There's all kinds of versions. But the oldest version of the Cinderella story that I'm aware of is actually found in the Bible, and it's the Song of Solomon. It's the Song of Solomon. And it goes kind of like this. Once upon a time, there was a king who lent out a vineyard to a family. And the family worked the vineyard, but the brothers were especially mean to one of their sisters. They forced her to work out in the hot sun. One day she met a shepherd and they became friends. Over time, they fell in love. And he promised to take the young woman's hand in marriage, but her brothers didn't really believe it. Then the shepherd disappeared and left the girl heartbroken. But one day, the young girl is summoned to visit the king. She doesn't really know why. And when she walks in, she appears before him, and she sees the face of her beloved shepherd. And she marries the king, and they live happily ever after. That's the story of the Song of Solomon, put together between the lines as you read through this love poem. And it's a pretty amazing story. Now, Anybody who knows their Bible would have to stop and say, should we really take Solomon's advice on relationships, okay? Solomon, who was commanded, like, not to take, as a king, he wasn't supposed to take multiple wives. I'll take a thousand, you know? Like, he, you know, he wasn't supposed to worship other gods. Oh, I'll worship other gods. Like, like, in the end, Solomon made a mess of some things. But I think this book is in the Bible for a reason, and God gave Solomon a special spiritual gift of wisdom. Just because he abused it later doesn't mean he was wrong earlier. 
And so Song of Solomon will challenge us in a couple different areas. Now, when you read through the song, it's written from three different voices. And one of the things that's really important, if you go home and you're like, hey, baby, let's read the Song of Solomon together. You want to like be aware, like who's speaking. Uh, there's Solomon, and then there's um, somebody in the young woman. We don't really know her name. In chapter 6, verse 13, they call her the Shulamite. Shulamite in the Hebrew language is just the, 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 the feminine form of the word Solomon. So in essence, this is a book of the story of Mr. and Mrs. Solomon, okay? And then there's one other group that speaks. They're called, depending on your translation of the Bible, either the daughters of Jerusalem or the young women of Jerusalem. And they have these little, you know, they, they're like the little chorus girls that come in. Ha, ah, ha, it's a song. Yeah, I don't know. It's a trip, man. It, it's weird. And look, as you're reading through the Song of Solomon, like you, gotta, you can't really roll this stuff out to your, to your spouse or your significant other. It, 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 it kind of gets weird. I remember once I tried it. Lori came home. I said, beloved. I said, let us go to the fields together. I want to go for a walk. And she looked at me and blinked, and she goes, oh, you want to watch the game? And she grabbed, uh, no lie, I'm not, she grabbed the remote control and turned the TV on. And I'm like, yeah, I do want to watch the game, actually, so perfect. <laughs> Doesn't really work today. Some people see the Song of Songs chronologically, like, like when you look through it, chapter one, they meet, chapter two, they're courting, chapter three, you have their marriage and their honeymoon, chapter uh, four and five, you have conflict, drama, resolution, uh, chapters six and seven, you know, you, you, you sort of see it continue to move forward as they go on in their relationship. But some people like to see the whole book as this chronological treatment. And those, that chronology is there, but it's loose. It's more like Polaroid pictures, like you're looking through a scrapbook of a couple looking back over the years that they were together, and they're acknowledging their beginning and their start and their marriage, but it's not strictly chronological. I mean, the very like beginning of the book gets a little steamy right out of the gate. They're already married. I mean, check this out. Sol Song of Solomon, chapter one, beginning of verse four. Help me out on this red word. It says, take me with you. She's speaking. Take me with you. Come, let's run. The king has brought me into his what? bedroom. They're not going in there to decorate, <laughs> right? She's, I mean, so from the very beginning, it's like, whoo, all right. King's taking me into the bedroom. It's on. And, you know, marriage and family therapists will tell you that, like, there's four landmines most romantic relationships really struggle with. Uh, one is money, which we've been talking about that. By the way, God's way with money. I know we've mentioned it already. It's coming up February 11th, this next Saturday, right here in, in this room, or uh, here at this location. It's um, a seminar uh, for a few hours. You can get a lot of tools and resources on budgeting and managing your finances, or you can watch it for free online. It's available. Uh, just go to central.family if you want to register. God's way with money. Um, the second line of mine would be religion. But since you're all here in church, at least no matter what you believe, you came together. Good job. If you're under the sound of my voice, awesome. Well done. Religion, money, religion, uh, intimacy, and communication. And Song of Solomon is going to really speak to intimacy and communication in the way it addresses things in our relationships. So over the next five weeks, we're going to dig in. I want to encourage you to be here each week. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about dating before and after marriage. I think it's going to be really powerful. Another way that the Song of Solomon can help improve our relationships is to remind us to recognize the importance of character. Recognize the importance of character in your life. And you see it if you go back up to the very first verses, uh, chapter 1, Verse 2, she's talking, and she says, Kiss me and kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. How pleasing is your fragrance. <laughs> Come on, a lot of ladies do not understand that line. How pleasing is your fragrance? Your what? Your name is like the spreading fragrance of scented oils. No wonder all the young women love you. Your name. Now, the name in the Old Testament refers to like a person's character. It's like who they are at their core. And she's saying, look, you're a person of character, and it's known kind of who you are. Others know it and recognize it. I know it. She says, you're like scented oil poured out. In other words, it's a beautiful, powerful thing. And I think that's important because we live in a culture that is infatuated with external appearance. It's all about how you look. Is she beautiful? Is he hot? It's all about like, like how you look. And it's all about like how you feel. Did you get the butterflies? 
You know, I walk through and like a dating show, reality shows on TV, and they're like, like, you know, do you think he's the one? And they're like, oh yeah, definitely. Like, like when we kissed, you know, I felt the, I had the butterflies. <laughs> I mean, those are gonna die. <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna do then. But you're gonna need more than that, sister. Come on, you're gonna need some more than that. And one of the things that I think you need is, is character. Look, I, I believe people ought to be attracted to one another, but, but character should be equally, if not more important, because you may be attracted to how somebody looks, but you're going to have to live with who they are. And that's another thing. That's another thing. So if you're in a dating relationship, man, put character at the top of the list. Look, if they're a 10, but they lie, subtract nine. <laughs> Boom. Man, if they're hot, but they're self-absorbed, that's a red flag. Run. Look, if you want to show off their picture, but you have to make excuses for them in person, that's a problem. That's a problem. And you know what we often think? I'll fix him. Come on, women. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to do my work. I'm going to fix him. But the reality is, like, as much as we would all like to be able to change other people, you can't change another person. You can lovingly influence them to the degree they'll let you. And a lot of women have been good for men over the years in that way. But you cannot just change them, and there's no guarantees that they'll actually change anyway. So here's some questions. If you're dating, uh, these are some questions to maybe to challenge your kids with when they look at their friendships, if they start dating, like questions to help us determine a person's character. First question is this, how does this person act under stress? You want to know who somebody is? Look at how they act under stress and pressure. Do they totally freak out? Do they melt down? Do they, do they, do they blame others? Like, like, how do they process pressure? She says, your name, it's like a, a scented perfume poured out. You know, the way they, they, they got those perfumes in the ancient world, they would take olives and they would put them under incredible pressure that would produce these, these scented oils. Pressure reveals a person's character. All of the studies on marital satisfaction basically show that as soon as you have kids, your marital satisfaction begins to decrease. And throughout your kids' lives at home, elementary school, junior high, high school, as your kids age, your marital satisfaction decreases inversely. Aren't you encouraged right now? <laughs> Just what they show. But here's the thing, once the kids graduate, your marital satisfaction rebounds. So hang in there, you only got 15 more years. You can do this, you got this. Now we love our kids, you love your kids. I don't think it's about the kids, but what is it about? It's about stress, y'all, right? The stress that gets introduced into a home. You start adulting hard, it gets stressful. So before you ever get married, you want to be looking at how this person deals with stress. Because if you start thinking, well, once we get married, the stress will be better, you're smoking something and it ain't legal. <laughs> this version is not legal. Because what actually happens is more stress will be introduced to your life. And nobody's perfect in how we handle it, but it says a lot about a person's character. All right, here's another one. Uh, what, you know, what do others say about this person? What do others say? Now, I know when you're in love, you're dating somebody, like, you don't care what other people say. You know, you just, you know, I love them, it doesn't matter. I got the butterflies, butterflies. <laughs> right? But at some point when those butterflies die, I mean, when you first fall in love, you're running through the fields to the sound of music. You know, the challenge is when those butterflies die, you're like running through the fields to Metallica. You know, like, like it's a whole other vibe now, right, going on in your life. Because at, at some point, you're going to look around and you're going to go, how could I not see that? How did I miss all this? These, these issues, you know, that, that they have. How did I, how was I blind to that? And, and none of us are perfect. But I will say, like, 
other people probably saw it. You just weren't listening to other people, right? So lean in to the wisdom of the people around you that love you and care about you. Be open to their wisdom and their insight because maybe they see some things that you can't see right now. Here's a third question. How does this person treat others? How does this person treat others? Because how somebody treats others tells you a lot about how they're one day going to treat you. And if you're in a relationship with somebody and they're constantly tearing other people down, if they're constantly deceiving others and lying to others, don't be so naive to believe that they won't one day lie to you. Right? So, the, so, so when you're navigating, look, if you want to see how they will treat you one day, look at how they're treating others today. Right? <laughs> Character is important. And the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon from the very beginning calls out character and acknowledges your name matters, who you are matters. And in a culture obsessed with what you look like, man, I want to encourage you, cultivate your character. Here's a third idea, and that is to express your love effectively. Express your love effectively. How many of you have ever heard of this famous book? It's gone all over the world called The Five Love Languages. Anybody heard of The Five Love Languages? Some of you? It's a great book. If you haven't heard it, you can listen to it on audio or read it. It's fantastic. Or I'll just give you the summary in 20 seconds. Somebody's like, yeah, perfect. That's why we're here. Five Love Languages looks at the five ways people give and receive love. It's just a framework to help us understand it. And to simplify it, I saw a great post on social media to help explain the five love languages around burritos. Okay? <laughs> so here it is. The five love languages. One of the love languages is this. Words of affirmation. Right? Some people, they receive love and they give love like through words of affirmation. This is a good burrito. Uh, acts of service. I made you a burrito. Receiving gifts. Here's a burrito. <laughs> quality time. Uh, 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 quality time. Let's go get some burritos together. <laughs> Physical touch. Arms are wrapped around, uh, arms around a person in a warm hug like a burrito. So there it is. The five love languages around a burrito. So you can just go home on your way home and be like, so how would you like your burrito? And there you go. Right? <laughs> what was so powerful to me about the five love languages, and I won't get into all, all, all of that, but what was so powerful to me was just the acknowledgement that we give and receive love differently. And um, I think for me, I had to realize that so often in my relationships, not just with my spouse, but also with my kids, that I often show them love in a way that I receive love but not always in the way they receive love. And if you're showing somebody love in the way you receive love and they don't receive it the same way, they're not really experiencing that as love even though you mean it as love for them. You know, example for me, like my greatest love language is probably acts of service, right? So I'm always wanting to do an act of service for my kids or my wife, even though that's not really how they receive, like my wife receives love through quality time. That's like her number one thing. Like, like you know, let's go get a burrito together. And I'm, I, I'm doing acts of service. Like, look at all these burritos I made for you, man. Come on. <laughs> you know, we go eat them alone, but they're amazing. So I, I, and to this day, like recently I did this, I took Lori out to the garage because I had cleaned the car. And I was like, look at this, Lori. Like I did this for you. And I showed her like, look at the car, man. Everything's clean. The gum's clean. I got under the seat. I got the food. I said, just feel this. Just run your hand down the, just feel that mm, vinyl. Yes. <laughs> clean. And Lori has had to learn over the years to really fake it in those moments. This is so amazing, wow. It's clean, incredible. I mean, this is unbelievable, but deep down she's like, I could care less. Let's go get a burrito together in the dirty car. That would have been a better use of the last two hours, you know, right? And I'm like, man, I cleaned the car for you. This is a clean burrito. Nope. So I still try to show love to Lori in my kind of love language. And, and I have to stop and remember, like, she receives it 
differently. And so if I want to communicate love to her, I have to operate in a way that she receives love. Not only with her, I have to do this with my kids. If you've never thought about this, this could be a life-changing thing for you. Find out how your children receive love. Maybe it's gifts. Maybe it's words of affirmation. Maybe it's acts of service. Um, you know, like, like maybe it's physical touch. Like how do your kids feel loved? And you can ask them, depending on their age. You can try to pull that out of them. You can just, you can look at how they show love to others. Like my son, you know, if I said, hey, Ethan, you know, he's a teenager, like, like how do you receive love? He'd be like, weirdo, I'm out. You know, like, it would be, it would be conversation over, right? You know, because he, he doesn't even, he's like, I, that's a crazy, I don't know. But here's what I know about my son. I watch him, like, like, randomly, you know, he, you know, I won't, there'll be no words of affirmation, no acts of service, nothing. But then randomly I'll wake up one morning and I'll have a, my goodness, you know, a 200 word text message about how he loves me. And you know what that tells me? Words of affirmation is not only how he's showing love, more than likely it's how he receives love. Think about that with your kids, your dating relationships with your spouse. Because until you figure that out, you don't know what the target is to show them that you actually love them, right? So that's a huge thing. Now, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. One of the things we see um, Solomon do is he communicates so effectively to this young woman words of affirmation. And this is not how everybody receives love, but I do think it's how she received love. And you look at chapter 1, verse 8. She's very down on herself. She says, my skin's dark. I've been burned by the sun. I've worked outside. Which, by the way, today we're all about dark skin and suntans and all the things. Back then, it was like, no, that means you've been out in the field working, right? So she's... At one point, she's very self-conscious about all of that, right? And she calls that out. And he just praises her again and again. Um, and so you see it here. He says, you're as exciting, my darling, as a mare among Pharaoh's stallions. I mean, it probably won't work for you to go home and be like, baby, you're as awesome as a horse. <laughs> I mean, I, I love you like that cow out there in the field. No, I mean, it just... It's, it's a whole other thing we're reading here. But here's, here's what's happening. Like, like what he's saying is, what they would do is, is a mare, they would take a female horse and they would bring a female horse out when like Pharaoh's stallions are getting ready to go into battle or go into war. And they would walk the mare in front of the male horses and the male horses are like, hmm, hmm. yeah, baby. And they're getting fired up. Because they're like, we're about to charge. We're about to go. It's game on. You know, like, like, and that's how they get them fired up for battle. And so they bring the mayor out. And Solomon's saying, you do that for me. Like when you walk in the room, I'm like, oh, all the heads turn to you. You're like a mayor walking out in front of Pharaoh's stallions. He says, how what? Lovely are your cheeks, your earrings set them afire. How lovely is your neck enhanced by a string of jewels. Come on, somebody. We will make for you earrings of gold and beads of silver. All the jewelry people right now ought to be going, whoa, I got to mark that verse down. Jewelry is biblical. <laughs> it is biblical. I have found my life verse is it. But you see what he's doing? He's praising her. He's pouring into her. He's giving her words of affirmation. Now, not everybody receives love through words of affirmation. Some of you, you know, you can talk to people and, and praise their looks and all that. And they may look at you and be like, look, first of all, I don't really need that. And secondly, I feel like you're overcompensating. Like maybe you don't think I'm attractive at all. People are different, right? You got to find out how other people receive love and then share it with them. And what it will do, this is your homework for this week. Think about your kids, think about your spouse. If you already know, you know, then, then you know. If not, find out how they receive love and do one thing this week for somebody you care about in your life that shows love to them in a way they receive it. Because here's the deal. The quality of your life will be determined by the quality of those relationships. It's the core thing. And I think so often we put those relationships on autopilot for work and demands and busyness and we reach over our family and friends and even our kids and we take care of all the other things around us. But those relationships actually determine the quality of your life. So lean into them and pour into them and communicate love in a way that they receive it.
Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith. And I would love to just give you that opportunity because God wants to be in a relationship with you and he loves you. He cares about you. So if you're here and God's been moving in your heart, if he's been tapping you on your shoulder in your life, I'd love to lead you in a prayer to open your heart up to him. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're ready to take that step, you can just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me just to say before God and to say to me, you're going to trust him in your life today. Just slip your hand in the air. Bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Just reach out to him today. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. God, I thank you for each person just reaching out to you. I pray you'll fill their life with your peace, your joy, your forgiveness. Bless and empower in their lives in every way. God, fill us with joy as we trust you and follow you. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. To those of you that made spiritual commitments, I just want to tell you congratulations. And after our experience, we'd love to connect with you out in the lobby at our Next Step area. We've got a gift and a journal we'd love to give you as you've made that commitment in your life. Or you can always go to central.family and click the link, I've decided to follow Jesus. We can get that to you digitally as well. Well, at this time, if you'll stand together with me, let's put our hands together for, um, uh, for Pastor Nick as he comes to close out this experience. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for that incredible message of hope. And listen, family, if you made that decision, I want you to click on that button. Go to central.family, click on that button that says, I decided to follow Jesus, and we're going to send you those resources to help you along in your journey. Well, family, as you go throughout this week, I want you to hang on to Romans 8. That says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up.